Hey, welcome everybody to another Wednesday webinar. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I'm Dave Etkin. I'm the director here at the Louisville office of the Kentucky Small Business Development Center Network. Um, and uh, as always, as I say, if um, as we, uh, if you look to the bottom of your screen there, and if you don't see a toolbar, just take your little cursor and hover down the bottom. It should pop up for you. And there you'll find the chat feature. And if you wouldn't mind, just so that we can check and make sure that everything's working well. Um, just say hello and tell us where you're joining from. I think we had a little sound issue here just a second ago. So that always makes me nervous and um, wanting to know whether you can hear and see us well. There's Kathy, Kathy Park, great friend of mine. Kathy has the coolest business in town. I always talk about her. It's, she's got a great story. I need to bring you on sometime, Kathy, so you can just tell your story because it's awesome. Uh, Shivana, Margaret. Hey, Margaret. Good to see you again. Jacqueline, Samantha, Buckner, Kentucky. Lovely place, Buckner, right? So, um, yeah, thanks for joining us today. And um, as we go through um, today's um, today's session, this, um, if you have any um, questions or comments, just put them in the chat and we'll get to them. You can also see the Q&A feature if you want to do something anonymously. You can you can do that. There's Suzanne. Hey, Suzanne, I see you all the time. I need, we need to meet. Uh, she's in Pikesville. Uh, Alan Kern, Alan at Kern's Kitchen. I don't know if you've had Derby pies, but he's the he's the guy that makes them. So, Alan, good to see you today. Um, I um, have been on this quest. I've got a team that I manage outside of the SBDC, and we uh, have been struggling with culture and performance and stuff. And so, I've been so interested in that. And um, there is uh, a lot of resources out there, but one of the best is our guest today, Heather Yaird, who is a performance coach, and um, she's a good friend of mine. And I, Heather, I'm just not going to steal your thunder, so I'm just going to let you come on. Don't forget to unmute yourself and uh, say hello to everybody. Thank you, David. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Excited to get the opportunity to speak to you today about mindset and how that can impact performance of your own, your employees, your business, and ultimately lead to more business growth. So thank you yeah. so much for your time. Yeah. All, all problems are people problems, right? That's what I've always been told. Yes. Yes, it, all starts, it all starts right here. <laughs> yeah. So again, if you have any questions or comments, just Put them in the chat there, um, and we'll get to them. You know, whenever we, you know, at, either at the end or even during the uh, during the session. So, yes. Heather, you want to share your screen, and we'll yes, just jump right in. Without further ado, um, I will yes. do my best. If there are questions that go in the chat, um, I'll do my best to attempt to look that way and answer them. If not, I know David's got my back, and he'll take it from there. We'll make sure to get everyone's questions if there are. <laughs> Uh, when they come. So uh, without further ado, good afternoon. Again, what are we talking about today? Um, I'm going to be sharing with you what is mindset. Next, I'm going to share how I have experienced is the best way to recognize mindset among your team and walk you through that conversationally. After that, share some supporting research, right, that was conducted to kind of validate this theory of mindset and its impact on performance. Then we're going to talk about praise, right? Specifically how communication when praising individuals that work with you, your peers, even personally, can induce mindset, impact uh, mindset, performance, production, and so forth. Then share four steps to changing your mindset and share two of my favorite tools that you can use to enhance performance through curiosity. First, I will take a brief moment to talk about me. Hi. Uh, my name is Heather Yared, and I am a performance coach. So it's a pleasure to be speaking in front of you today. Uh, currently, I do a couple things. What I'm going to focus on now is uh, consulting with Impact Sales Systems, where I primarily coach on sales and growth for solely closely held businesses. We focus on the things that are within a person's control. And what is that? That's themselves. So working with us, we would focus on the behaviors behind selling, how that's impacting your business currently. We contract to a result, and that's typically to double production. And we do work with you until that goal is hit. Um, at the end of the day, our mindset drives our behaviors. And how we show up every day is what 
110% impacts our team dynamics, what we can achieve, and how we can produce for our companies, ourselves, and again, even in our personal lives. So let's get started talking about mindset. If you've never heard of the concept of mindset, uh, let me introduce you to the work of Dr. Carol Dweck from Stanford University. Her book, Mindset, The Psychology of Success, led to a tidal wave of educators, parents, leaders across the globe becoming interested in this idea of mindset and how it can impact your life, both personally and professionally. Mindset is defined as a belief or a way of thinking that determines one behavior, like the outlook, their mental attitude. So in essence, what we perceive is what we will see in our own reality at work and at home. Thoughts, when repeated in your head or communicated to others, become beliefs. Beliefs over time become a person's mindset and their outlook, which therefore what impacts their behavior. So Dr. Carol Dweck's research led her very early on to identify that even children as small as the age of four can hold different mindsets and that can impact the work that they do and impact how their relationships are personally and professionally into adulthood. What she found are two primarily. There's fixed and there's growth. Let's talk about fixed mindset. So um, I chose a rock to represent fixed mindset. Um, it's not malleable. What you see is kind of what you get, right? Unless you take a hammer, smash it and so forth, it's hard. It doesn't really change its shapes unless many, many years of wear and tear. It is fixed in a sense. Those that hold a fixed mindset, they tend to believe that you have a natural ability to catch on to things quickly, that some people are talented and some people aren't. So think of it as you either have it or you don't, right? It's not something that can really change. Um, they believe that you're born with intelligence. It's not something that really can be evolved over time. Then there's growth mindset. I chose Play-Doh. Play-Doh's malleable. It can be shaped differently. You can make a pancake. You can make a sausage. You can make a ball. It's flexible. You can pull it, stretch it. Um, you can even make it a different color if you want to mix both Play-Dohs together. You can make it sparkle. Whatever it may be, it's malleable. It changes. And this is very representative of the growth mindset, that mindset of possibility, specifically around curiosity. So with a growth mindset, people do believe that you can become more talented, more intelligent through practice, through learning, through curiosity and being resourceful. Um, nurturing yourself and focusing on that belief is key. Much of the research that's been centered around uh, mindset has been focused on intelligence, right? So some of the data that I'm going to share is representative of that. What also stood out in this work was into adulthood, as we got older, mindset showed up in a way that uh, was very egoic, I would say, right, from your ego. So the most apparent differentiator that you can listen for with yourself or with others is centered around why people are doing what they're doing. So with a fixed mindset, it's about proving yourself. With a growth mindset, it's about improving yourself. So attitude, ladies and gentlemen. So for all intents and purposes of this uh, conversation, I will define attitude as it is in the traditional sense, right? A feeling about someone or something typically that's reflected in behavior. So fixed mindset is adamant about proving themselves to them. And growth mindset is around learning and focusing on improving, which is um, a pretty big difference, especially when it relates to performance. So now that we've uh, got some background, right, I've described the growth and fix at a very high level. Let's talk about how you can start to recognize mindset in your team. I'm going to get very granular here. I'm going to break down for you both fixed and growth mindset. Um, looking into focus and questions and how folks holding these mindsets might internalize situations that they're experiencing. I invite you, as I go through this, if you want, to write down for yourselves where you might uh, see this, whether it's you at work, you at home, or whether you might be experiencing this with your team dynamics. It could be helpful in really implementing this into your business. So first, looking at focus. I just shared that fixed mindset tends to focus on proving themselves. Fixed mindset, their focus goes to the outcome. Now, until an outcome has happened, there's nothing yet to judge, 
per se. So fixed mindset folks tend to focus on the outcomes of any work that they produce, and they're looking to judge themselves on whether or not it was perfect, right? That you might hear that dialogue of, well, I could have done better. I'm not saying that that's, again, good or bad. It's just a focus of they need to be perfect. Think of someone who needs to produce a website. Um, it takes a long time to do so if you are hyper-focused on it being exactly how you want it, right? That is something that tends to lean more towards that judgment, that fixed mindset. Self-judgment is a primary focus. And in a team setting, this can show up as focusing on outcomes of something as a result of the amount of effort they had to put into it and the individuals that were included in that. I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Whereas growth mindset, the focus goes on learning. It's about the process. So let's say that you put together a data analysis for your boss. You send it over, you hear back, wow, this is exceptional, very thorough, well put together, you did great at this. Someone holding a growth mindset who might not even have thought that they were great at data analysis would think to themselves, wow, I winged this. I, I can't believe they think that's great, that's awesome. And then take the opportunity to get curious with their boss and say, you know, Mrs. Manager, what did you like about it? What was that format? Um, it's not that they don't care about the outcome, right? It's that when you hold that growth mindset, you tend to believe that the effort you put in is bound to lead to greatness and success. So the focus difference there is on judging versus learning. Another area where we see this come up is around failure. What does failure mean? So from a fixed mindset perspective, those that hold a fixed mindset believe that either you have it or you don't. What is the key word there? Don't worry, I'm not looking at the chat, so I'm not gonna be able to say or call anybody out on that. I'll just answer it for you. If fixed mindset individuals believe that either you have it or you don't, the key word there is you. The focus is literally on them as a person. Failure comes across as I am a failure. They tend to tie their identity to whether or not the outcome or the result was good and or bad. They also might internalize it in a way of thinking, I'm not talented enough. Maybe I shouldn't be in this role. I don't have what it takes. I'm not smart enough. Whereas the growth mindset separates the activity, the outcome, the deliverable from themselves. When they internalize it, it is, I have failed. And this is usually followed by that curiosity to figure out how they need to work smarter next time, how they can be more resourceful, and what working harder looks like as it relates to the group setting, which is very different than I'm not talented, I'm not enough, and more so maybe the effort I put in wasn't enough, how can I improve? The next question that has been a big indicator, right, of identifying fixed versus growth mindset is around success. So internalizing success for a fixed mindset when they have succeeded, since again, that's more focused on the outcome, on judging that outcome. It's more about the fact of whether or not they finished, period. I did it. I completed the task. I don't need to do it again, right? I've proven to myself I could hit that deadline. That's it. Um, opportunity for self-reflection here. Um, has anyone on this Zoom call ever wanted something so bad that they practiced, they you know, taught themselves, worked endlessly hours at a time to figure it out. And once they got it, once they achieved it, once they got the goal or whatever it may be, uh, they flatlined. And when I say flatlined, I mean that the excitement was short-lived, anywhere from a few seconds to a day, whatever you thought, but whatever it was, the expectation of how you would feel when you actually accomplished that goal did not align with what you thought you'd feel. Believe it or not, that is a tendency of a fixed mindset because it's centered not around evolution, but the fact that subconsciously there is this need to prove to yourself that you could do it as opposed to learn more about it, right? There's different research that speaks to this, but success at times cannot feel as good if we have that fixed mindset because achieving that goal leads us to that short-lived, I'm smart, I did it, I'm good. And it also limits your motivation. To a growth mindset individual, what does success mean? It means I achieved the goal. Let's reflect. Let's get curious. How did I get there? I learned something. What do I need to do to sustain it? So success is validated through the learning element. 
The next question is around effort. When you hold a fixed mindset, although you know effort is required in all facets of life, whatever mindset you hold, subconsciously, those with a fixed mindset can perceive time, the amount of time it takes for you to complete something as a bad thing. This is based on the belief that you must learn or deliver on something more quickly. In a team, this can show up as someone who's wanting to finish their work ahead of the deadline, or if any of you have individuals that work for you that always finish or submit something to you before the deadline, but it turns out that there's some minor mistakes or there are some uh, formatting or whatever items that could be avoided if they were just more thorough, right? Or if they had that strong desire to um, not focus on that effort. Um, they also want to uh, or can be folks that are the first to speak up before you're finishing your direction, before you're finishing what deliverables or what project is ahead of you. They might interrupt, um, cause uh, a interruption in the delivery of that just so they can show and communicate that they know, they already know what's coming down or how to deliver on something. Sometimes this um, internalization of effort can also be directed to self-comparison, but ways to recognize this again in your team is if you're having someone repeatedly uh, finish things ahead of deadline, finish things first, prioritize that, there are still things that were missed or are interrupting the flow of delivery or wanting to always uh, get curious in a way that is more defensive, you can likely think to yourself, this might be someone who's holding a fixed mindset that I might want to approach. I want to highlight this again really specifically. Effort essentially is not a great thing. Fixed mindset tends to lean into too much effort, too much energy is defeating. It depletes them. It completely changes the level of work and their desire to work because they feel and are internalizing. I'm not getting this quick enough, which can slow their production, their productivity, and then also impact others on their team, causing them to be less enthusiastic about it. When it comes to growth mindset, they think of effort as the path. It's the road that you want to take to get to the goal. It's a necessary part of evolution. It's actually what makes them excited. It's worth its weight in gold. Effort is almost the, um, the golden nugget. If they put their blood, sweat, and tears into something, it makes them feel alive. Um, doesn't mean that they're not hitting their deadline. They are, but they do want to take that time to go above beyond in a different way. Um, others witnessing this can increase efficiency and enable them to maintain momentum when things get going and allow goals not only to be set, but met. With a growth mindset, you expect that everything takes time. And it's actually the root of what makes work and performance and team dynamics worth being a part of. The next question is what does the person think of themselves when it comes to learning something new? If they're trying to learn something new and they're holding a fixed mindset, there is a level of vulnerability there that could be dangerous. I'm trying this thing, I don't know if I'm gonna get it. I don't know if I wanna let someone know whether I do or not, but if I don't get it right away, what if I look stupid? What if I appear dumb? What if I'm being judged right now? What if this answer makes or breaks my opportunity for a promotion? So learning something new and being in a, a dynamic, a, a team dynamic where they are put in a position to have to learn something new or speak to it can, again, have a level of vulnerability that's not necessarily uh, productive for them and efficient for them. Because remember, they're focusing on the outcome. What is my answer going to be? And if they're judging themselves, they are concerned about folks judging them as well. Whereas growth mindset, that individual holding that mindset is going to say, hey, I'm trying something new. This is an opportunity for me to grow, learn, and develop. Likewise, if you are holding a fixed mindset when you do feel the most smart, um, it, it's going to show up the same way. So a lot of times when I'm working with companies and assessing team dynamics and culture and performance, in my listening tour, one of the first questions that I ask to determine mindset is when do you feel smart, right? When is it like, if you could put that into words, what does that look like? And nine times out of 10, the answer of individuals holding that fixed mindset is when I get it perfect right away. So perfect performance right away is consistently connected to whether or not they can keep their momentum if they can be efficient, even if they feel confident motivating others. Growth mindset, when I ask that question, when do you feel smart? It's when I learn something new. 
Last but not least, I just touched on this um, attitude towards others. So mindset also impacts attitude and attitude towards others. Think about it. If a fixed mindset person is judging themselves, how do you think their mind chatter sounds? How do you think their inner dialogue sounds? How do they talk to themselves? How do you talk to yourselves if you're recognizing um, fixed mindset tendencies in yourself? You know, what are you saying? The more judgmental and the more harsh you are on yourself in that fixed mindset space, it's a safe assumption that they believe, again, that others are judgmental to them as well, which will cause this ability um, to get defensive when challenged, when questioned about work that's being done in a team um, environment. So again, this can show up in the workplace. You could recognize it if someone's feeling threatened by others around them in conversation, when they're approached um, with an idea or a recommendation or even feedback on something they put together, this person can automatically be defensive and um, be fearful of why you're bringing it to them. Attitude towards others as it relates to a growth mindset, you can find that those folks are thinking of more being resourceful, right? How can this person help me? How can I leverage this person's brain to get us where we need to be? How can I get more feedback in order to learn? Uh, Randy Pausch said one of my favorite quotes that really helped crystallize the idea of mindset for me. He was an American educator and a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon. And I think this sums up, again, both fixed and growth mindset uh, in a very conceptual way, right? The brick walls are not there to keep us out. The brick walls are there to give us a chance to show us how badly we want something. Now, I invited you to note down whether or not you recognize any fixed or growth mindset tendencies, either in yourself or those on your team. Um, depending upon how those tallies went, uh, I want you to know one very important thing. There is no such thing as right or wrong as it relates to your mindset. And there is no such thing as good or bad. If you have recognized some fixed mindset tendencies, guess what? Permission to be human. And there are opportunities for you to shift. I also want to note that growth mindset teeter-totters in both spaces as well. I know a lot of what I said about growth probably sounds Rob Ross is Goomba uh, to folks, that it's all rainbows and lollipops, but life is what it is and things happen. And everyone is always walking a line. It's just being prepared to have the tools and being able to recognize and being comfortable knowing that these things exist and mind chatter, having it doesn't mean you're crazy. It just means that you're becoming more self-aware and you have more control and more of an ability to determine your team's performance, your own performance, which inevitably will result in the business results you're looking for. Now I wanna explore some of the key research, some of the studies that will crystallize mindsets for some of you that this might be new to, and hopefully this information will enable you to walk away more confident that mindset is something that can impact performance and business growth. There were two tests done to understand the mechanisms behind growth mindset and fixed mindset. I'm going to share the two studies that I personally found fascinating and that really helped hone in on why this becomes such an issue for people when they do hold that fixed mindset and how it can impact their performance. So the first, a study was conducted looking into um, the role of holding a specific mindset as it relates to social comparisons. There are two types of social comparison. You can compare upward, which means you're looking at people who have more than you and comparing yourself to them. Then there's downward. You're uh, wanting to look at, towards folks that have listened to you or that have done worse than you. And in this study, um, particularly around students, um, all these students had the opportunity to, they took a test and they were said, you get to look at the tests, everybody's results once they were done, right? They had the opportunity to look and review the work that other students did. They weren't going to see the names on the paper. They would just get to see their grades and the answers that they had and how the teacher graded them. So this was very intentional in the sense of there was a particular question that was asked in an attempt to categorize fixed first growth. And it was, who wants to see who did better than them. So of the grade that you got, who wants to look at the tests that were higher? Then others were asked, who wants to look at tests that were worse, right, than them? What was found was those that held a fixed mindset were more likely to say that they wanted to see the papers of those who did worse than them. Growth mindset folks 
wanted to see the papers of folks that did better than them. Growth mindset, again, focusing on where could I have been more detailed? Where could I have provided more depth? Where are the gaps in my understanding so I can learn? Fixed mindset, folks, we're looking more to see how badly did I fail compared to other people in this room. It was judgment, right? Judgment was at the core, the outcome, wanting to see if their fail was really that bad, i.e. social comparison downward was a central theme that was identified there. How could this impede performance? If you hold a fixed mindset and your focus naturally goes towards comparing whether or not you are the best, whether you are better and so forth, what you are doing is impeding your growth, right? How will that accelerate your own performance? It won't because if the fixed mindset individual is all about proving, right? As us as adults, then if you've proved yourself that you're good, that you're better, that you're the best, subconsciously the thought is there, I don't have more to do. I don't have more to learn. I can still perform at the level at which I am, still hit that promotion, still hit the results. There's that lack of desire to evolve and improve. So this type of thinking, this fixed mindset will subconsciously be feeding into you the idea that I don't have any more to learn. And that will demotivate. That will demotivate your performance. Fixed mindset going to the ego, right? Whether or not they did better than someone else can also impact the team members, depending upon their vulnerability, where they stand, their mindsets. If there is uh, someone who's outgoing and speaks up a lot, who really is focused on ensuring that people know that they're the best or that they know just as much, it can impact team dynamics. And I'm sure I don't need to go into detail about that. If you've experienced, you completely understand what that looks like. Um, the next study was conducted um, in a business school, students. So this was a mock business, and the focus was understanding how mindset can impact productivity and the success of a business. And the goal here that made this one unique is that it was to induce mindset. So very specific words and language were communicated to certain groups intentionally to try to induce a mindset and see how the words that create our worlds impact performance. So to give you some detail, the challenge was to create a business that uh, they had to work on for a certain period of time. It was computer simulated. They had to sell goods. They had to produce a certain level of profit. They had expenses. They had um, employees that they had to motivate and manage. And for this particular example, it was for a furniture company. So they induced a mindset in each group in this project. And it was a test to measure whether or not words can impact our performance. For the fixed mindset group, they told them, hey, this challenge that you're doing, right, this business that you're putting together, we're doing this to see and measure your basic underlying capability to be successful in business. Depending upon this result, this is going to tell us whether or not you have the ability to have your own company, whether you're going to be successful and your performance and how this goes will tell us the likelihood that you will have to succeed in business in the future. The other group was told, hey, this is an exercise in management skills. This is an opportunity for you to deliberately practice and get better and enhance your skills and improve upon what you're doing here in this school so that you can be successful in the future. Do you hear the difference? They were randomly assigned. Both groups were measured both pre and post, right, on how they communicated with each other and how their business thrived and how challenging the task was and how they faced those challenges. So the results they found were pretty unique. Those that were told that, hey, the purpose of this challenge is to enhance your skills and to help you succeed in the future, they performed significantly better than the fixed mindset group. They were more likely, excuse me, to identify mistakes early on and bring them to the attention of others. They were more likely to receive feedback to improve and maintain a healthy sense of competence, both as one individual, as a leader and collectively. And they were more productive and more profitable. The fixed mindset group, they did worse. They were less likely to speak up early on. Uh, they waited until the last minute to address um, any issues and ask questions. They were more likely to give up. And this actually snowballed. And as time went on, their profits dropped, as did their growth. So it was 
very impactful, the words that were used to motivate individuals to produce a thriving business. Communication induces mindset and impacts performance. So if you really think about it, if you're communicating to your team, to your staff, how they should deliver, how they should execute, what the purpose of their tasks are, no matter what they are. Can you see how that might impact internally how they're going to show up for you in your business, how they're going to produce? How do you communicate with your staff? Is it focused on them as a person, on their skill, right? When you're giving them feedback or when you're telling them why they're doing what they're doing, is it focused on their personal ability to do something well? and then tied to revenue? Or is it communicated in a way in, a way in which is multidimensional, right? This is why you're doing this. This is how you're gonna go about it. And this is what is expected of you to do it. But at the end of the day, it's all centered around growth. And that's the key takeaway from that second study. Your communication, how you communicate purpose to your team, to individuals, and even with yourself is a performance accelerator or blocker. Enhancing the skill set of the individuals on your team and communicating that as such will improve and drive those goals. If you can recognize how you're communicating now and whether or not mindset, fixed, or growth is present on your team, you can then meet people where they are and communicate with them in a way that helps you achieve your goals and helps everybody become more successful. Speaking about communication, and the effects that those words had on the performance, I'm going to now talk about praise, right? And how it can induce mindset, shift mindset, change it, right? What is the influence of praise? I'm going to speak at a high level to two types. In general, mindsets are developed from several different places, ladies and gentlemen. It can be self-esteem, labels and prejudice, praise and pressure all the way from childhood to present, even the media. I'm going to focus on praise and provide examples of the two types, right, and how we communicate those. So there's person praise and there's process praise. And depending upon how you praise your team, that can determine performance. So let's talk about person praise. Naturally, some of us uh, as leaders want to make our employees feel valued. Even our peers feel valued. And there's one way that we know how to do that. And that's just by praising them, right? Good job. Great. You know, and when it comes to giving person praise, it does sound like that. You're so great. You're so smart. You're so gifted. You're so brilliant. You're such a natural engineer. Wow. You got that so quickly. Some leaders will even communicate this to individuals, depending upon how empathetic they are, even if the job was not done how they wanted it to get done, even if it didn't meet expectations, just because they feel uneasy having those types of conversations or they don't want to hurt people's feelings, right? They tend to praise an individual, right, as a person because they don't want to make someone else feel uneasy and they themselves don't like that feedback. So, Again, person praise is directly related to the person themselves. And the praise is about them, which if you remember, a fixed mindset sees failure as I am a failure. Whether you think you're actually preventing someone from feeling a certain type of way or feeling valued, the way you communicate, and if it's focused on a person praise element, you're communicating from a fixed mindset place and in a way that can induce a fixed mindset to individuals on your team. So this praise can even trigger a person to be more sensitive, to become more judgmental over time, and to stop by accepting criticism or feedback in an effective way, which can stagnate performance. So receiving feedback based on the person themselves, not their work per se, has a tendency to make someone focused on getting more feedback over time, and that feedback will start to come from a judgmental place. And what you will see is they will spend more time on getting work in before deadlines, or even if on deadlines, and the pri primary uh, goal of your one-on-ones will be centered around them seeking validation. So as I have on that slide here, it breeds praise obsession. So my hope is that you can be aware right now and permission to be human of your praise. Are you communicating praise to your team in a way that makes it about them to feel better. And who are you doing that for? Are you doing that for yourself to save yourself from having a difficult conversation or making that person feel bad, whether you know they will or not? 
or for a different reason. Next, let's talk about process praise. Now, if we're looking at process praise, it emphasizes practice, strategic thinking, curiosity, and it empowers decision-making efforts. Making the praise external, more focused on the choice they made or the strategy they chose, how they went about being resourceful with their team will accelerate performance. This puts the focus on what? The growth mindset because growth mindset is enabling individuals to want to learn and having a desire to learn and then replicating that behavior through demonstration. So if you are praising around the process, it can accelerate performance because it will then cultivate a culture of curiosity, growth, and learning. Remember, it's about the path. It's the effort. It's the amount of time it took to achieve the goal. And doing this can help shift their focus and mindset on that process by default without even trying, which will then have you in a space where you can give more feedback and feel more comfortable as a leader giving feedback that might not be, you know, the best to hear at times. I just want to give you some examples of, of process praise again at a high level. It can look completely different. Uh, my goal here is not that for you to walk away and use these terms verbatim. It's just, again, giving a 50,000 foot perspective of what it looks like to focus on curiosity. What I want to highlight here is when I read these, it may not even feel like some of you may think, well, I'm not complimenting the person. And you're right, you're kind of not. And it might take away whatever it is that you thought you were doing to validate them. But research shows that getting curious and validating individuals, praising and giving recognition around the process actually over time does build more self-efficacy, self-esteem and team dynamics, strength around this. So just some examples that I shared here that will ensure that your you know, team is performing and you have a job well done is, um, you know, I really like how you demonstrated our year over year growth in more ways than one. What made you do that? Another way, clear direction impacts our results greatly and the quality of work delivered by you really shows that. What I'm saying there is if you're highlighting the directions, right, what you communicated needed to be done and how that impacted the result, the quality of their work, that's giving them that praise, that process praise. And then lastly, um, curiosity. What was the most resourceful thing for you while working on this project? This type of communication creates a psychologically safe space and it induces a growth mindset over time. It has a ripple effect on the team. And that is because it allows me, it would allow you, it allows that individual to determine for whatever is best for their higher good, what it is that they did well. They know that you're not upset about something. They know that you are recognizing the work that they did. They get to choose and figure out what it is that they did best in the effort they put in so they can repl replicate, excuse me, that behavior in the future. How else to praise your team? These are just other examples, again, at a high level to share um, for you guys to take away. Describe the positive behavior and the effort, providing details. I'm sure that's not new to some of you, right? Being very specific about what they did, whether it was a deliverable or whether it was how they handled a conversation. Avoid praise for low challenge activities or error-free successes. Now, I did give an example earlier about individuals wanting to turn something in before a deadline and them having small grammatical errors and, and so forth. I'm actually recommending that you don't note when they stop doing that, right? Because it doesn't take too much effort per se, right? It's a, it's a challenge that is, uh, if they just put a small amount of effort and shift their mindset and that could then again, deplete their motivation. So if you praise when they did not follow instruction or when they did not follow exactly what needed to be done or when they did have misses, it is only going to result in them kind of breeding and wanting that. So you want to avoid praise and you want to acknowledge when it does take a lot of effort. Be careful when praising after failure or mistakes. Praises must be sincere. I can't tell you how many times companies implement these um, executive leadership teams, you know, set weekly or bi-weekly or even monthly opportunities for people to do shout outs. And the uh, team sends out almost a carbon copy message over Slack to everybody like, hey, thanks so much for working here. Thanks so much for doing what you do. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten feedback that it feels fake. Um, if anyone on this call is doing that, no offense. I uh, just want to raise your awareness about the sincerity of it. 
If you do want to go with a, uh, a process and employee satisfaction plan that does uh, target cyclical outreach, I would invite you to make it customized per person to reduce that opportunity for them to feel that it's not sincere. Uh, reduce the amount of praise period, as I mentioned before, be curious, give examples about the work that they did, and then provide natural consequences i.e. an example of oh, some way to praise somebody would be getting the bonus or promotion if you're not in a position to do that. Potentially, it could be more responsibility. You would know that from your team, but that's another way that you can demonstrate praise without having to use specific words that relate to them as a person. So we've talked about praise, we've talked about mindset. I'm going to share with you four steps to changing your mindset. If you've recognized that you need to do so, if you think that potentially folks on your team need to shift or change their mindset, I'm going to highlight for you the four things Dr. Carol Dweck put in place that are proven to be effective once put into practice. So first, learn to hear your fixed mindset voices. No, you are not going crazy if you are hearing voices in your head. Um, it is actually metacognition. We all have it. So if you are hearing when you are talking to yourself in a way that is judgmental, when you are potentially being defensive, any of those things we talked about, just learn to hear them, accept them, give yourself grace, and be aware. Start to be aware so that you can know when you need to potentially shift in the moment. Two, recognize that you have a choice. If you want to grow, if you want to evolve, you can do that. And it is your choice to do that. You don't have to choose it every day, but you do have a choice because you now do know that these two types of mindsets are present and it can impact the performance and how you show up as a leader or as a peer. Talk back to it with a growth mindset. Yes, I am inviting you to talk to yourself. I do it out loud sometimes. I do it internally sometimes. It's very effective. But after this conversation, hopefully you have some examples that you can take away and understand in the moment when you need to take the opportunity for yourself or team members to basically prove yourself wrong and say, I'm judging myself right now. And I'm going to share a tool uh, here in a bit about that that will help you do it. But yes, I am saying talk back to that voice in your head. It is very healthy. And then take the growth mindset action, which are these two tools that I'm going to talk about now. So those are the four steps of changing the mindset, learning to listen. Hey, I have them. Here's what these are. Recognizing and accepting, giving yourself grace. You have a choice talking back to it, whether out loud yourself with a friend in a photo booth on your computer, whatever it may be, and then taking growth mindset action. What do I mean when I say take growth mindset action? There are tools that you can use. I'm going to share two that I have found most effective in working with companies and even my own teams. The first I call labels and lessons chart. So to change and shift your mindset, you can take a closer look in how you or your team collectively or individually label wins and setbacks. I invite you for a few days to just monitor how you think about setbacks. How do you think about wins? Look out for when you're labeling them. What are the labels that you're attaching to the setbacks? What are the labels that you're attaching to the wins? Are they positive? Are they negative? How are you internalizing them? Again, this can be done in individually or in a group, but understanding how that's being done gives you tangible evidence and tangible words that you can use to start 180-ing your conversation, your inner dialogue, to start shifting that mindset. The next is the choice map, which I have to say is my very favorite. If you have not heard about the book, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life, um, Dr. Marilee Adams sure did change mine when I was introduced to the choice map. She used the growth mindset and fixed mindset concepts and focused on the inner dialogue, right? The mind chatter and the evaluation of that to improve performance and outcomes on a daily basis or long-term in projects. How people were internalizing their communication with others and with themselves became the primary focus. And Dr. Adams changed fixed in growth to judger or learner. So the choice map is based on the concept that we have a choice. How are we gonna internalize situations? What particular path are we gonna go down when something arises, a situation, a difficult conversation? So there is a judger and a learner path. The judger path is more of a reactive path. It's kind of our knee-jerk reaction path. It's the path that your brain will go down if it's not regulated, if you're not aware of how you're currently thinking and how that impacts your behavior. 
The learner path is one that goes down what curiosity. Okay, it's it's making sure that in the moment you're understanding what has happened to you in the past, what you might be projecting, how that might be impacting you, and how it might be impacting the outcomes of your work. So falling into the judger pit, hopefully you can see this uh, clearly and it's not too small. If so, my apologies. Um, the judger path is, again, more of the reactive path. It's that knee-jerk path. It's a conversation that comes from interactions, whether again, it is around performance or whether it is around dialogue, it tends to be focused on a very judgmental space. Who's to blame, right? Looking for a winner and a loser, right? Looking to understand what's wrong with me. Why did I not hit this deadline? Why did she not uh, follow the directions I gave? Am I not communicating effectively? What's wrong with them? Are they not listening? Did you not understand the directions that I said? It's those types of thoughts that are rooted in what judgment? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with my communication? What's wrong with them? Why am I such a failure? Think fairness, but more so around blaming. Again, winning or losing and having to declare that. It's very problem focused, judgmental of yourself, which does what? Put you right there in that sinking judger pit. Then there's the learner path, the alternative path, the path of curiosity usually tends to be win-win focus because you're asking yourself questions about solving a problem, having a solution between you and another individual, you and your team. This path is more likely to take you down roads of solutions and business growth, right? Accelerated performance. It's more centered around what do I need right now? What am I missing? What do they need? How can I rectify this situation? Again, starts with what can I learn and how can I grow? And constantly prioritizing this and putting deliberate practice into focusing on what's possible. The choices that you have will take you down that learner path to where you are solutions focused, you can achieve whatever goals you have set forth collectively as a whole or individually. This approach is gonna be a lot more useful than judging yourself because again, judging yourself in that situation is what impedes your growth. But if we can collectively learn together and grow and put that into practice, you will see naturally that performance will be accelerated because we're trying to come from a place of understanding and owning where, how we're thinking is impacting ourselves, our performance, and the team as a whole. So if you catch yourself going down the judger path at any moment, I've got great news for you. Um, you can shift gears. You can catch yourself in situations. There are options. You can ask yourself. Instead of focusing on, again, what's wrong or who's to blame, you can think to yourself, what's happening in this moment? What is it that is causing me to think? this way about this individual? Did I stub my toe? Did someone cut me off at work? Ladies and gentlemen, it's self-awareness. Simply put, it's self-awareness. Shifting gears is around wanting to become more self-aware of how you show up in conversations and there is an opportunity to think of what's possible, how can I learn? There are particular switching questions. How else can I think about this? How can I ask myself open-ended questions, right? Not going down that narrow path, but switching your thoughts to that learner, that curiosity, what you want to learn. Because every opportunity, is, every scenario is an opportunity to learn about you, how you lead, and how you show up in your team. I can't begin to tell you how much I love this map. I have worked in different industries from financial all the way to tech startup, and I have witnessed it. Witness it changed team dynamics, whether again, it's on one-on-one -on -one type of dynamics or large groups, project initiatives, the choice to be more self-aware and conscious of your natural thought patterns and choosing to direct your thoughts in a place of curiosity versus blame is what creates unity, unification in teams, which then hits alignment, allows, and makes room for strategic alignment and cultivating that culture of decision-making and empowerment and possibility, which 110% results in business growth. Employee performance and business growth starts with mindset. So learning your team's mindset directly impacts performance. There are two now that you can be aware of, if you haven't already, that's fixed and growth. Our behaviors drive everything we do, whether we know that or not, subconsciously, it is motivating us to perform or not. 
I invite you to learn your team's mindset so you can directly impact the performance, accelerate the performance, or maintain it. Don't forget about praise. There's person praise and there's process praise. Person praise leads to that self-comparison, that judgment. If you have a tendency to praise individuals about them as opposed to the work that they did, know that that could be leading to that fixed mindset, that judgment, that self-comparison, that fear of performance. While process praise leads to confidence and growth and expansion. There were two tools that we talked about um, as our time was here together, which was the labels and lessons chart. So taking the opportunity to focus on setbacks and wins. How did you label them? How did you internalize those? What did you learn from those? And then the choice map. You have a choice. Are you going to be the judger? Or are you going to be the learner? Both of those tools can be pivotal in ensuring that you have high quality performance productivity from your team and achieve whatever business goal that you've set forth for either yourself or your team. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Thank you for your time. Oops, there we go. That was a lot, Heather, that was awesome. Um, yeah, Maya says that was great. And Samantha said that was amazing. So yeah, you, you, uh, you really knocked it out of the park today. Thank so you. you got a lot of comments and um, some questions here. So let's, let's jump right in. Um, so first off, how do you drive the desire for employees to have a malleable and curious mindset? Uh, so um, that's from the Q&A. What okay. do you think? Okay. And the question was, how do you drive them to want to have that? Is that the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great question. It starts with yourself. So mm -hmm. showing and demonstrating your desire for it, your thirst for it, uh, how much you've learned from it really sets the stage for them wanting more of it and leading by example from that, right? And just implementing it might not do anything. Some people might not want to even participate in it, but driving it from a place of what, again, outcomes based off of process, outcomes based off of purpose and um, them developing personally and professionally. That is what I have found has been the most successful in both leading the team and coaching organizations is making the drive multidimensional. This is going to help you personally and professionally. And then also, again, leading by example, you choosing and demonstrating how great and all the changes that have happened when you have chosen to evaluate your own mindset and then just owning when you've hit a fixed mindset moment yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> great. Uh, Jacqueline says, can you share which peer review journals you use as references? This topic is so interesting and I'm interested in reading more about it. Yes. Um, I didn't say this in the beginning. I'm a positive psychology practitioner and I took a, um, program, a hybrid program from the positive psychology masters at you, at UPenn. So I have a ton of, um, you know, sources and, and things like that. And I can definitely pull those and, uh, get them over to David so he can ship those out. Okay. Um, yeah, somebody also asked about a reading list. Uh, yeah, can we get uh, the book information on the choice map and any other suggested readings that you have? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, obviously, Carol Dweck, Mindset, mm -hmm. and Dr. Marilee Adams, uh, was Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. I can send over that information as, and so forth too as well. Those, again, those changed my life, both personally and professionally. So. <laughs> If anyone wants to start a book club, let me know. <laughs> um, is one mindset more compatible for certain tasks? I mean, for instance, are fixed mindsets more compatible for repetitive work like manufacturing and growth for creative work? Oh, wonderful, wonderful question. I would not... I personally would not use the words that one is more compatible for certain tasks. That is leaning more towards personality, right? So we do DISC assessments and DISC assessments absolutely demonstrate the characteristics, the traits of individuals who could be more successful at tasks. This mindset will impact all of that. So there's not one mindset that's more compatible for either or. It's all about the perception of how um, important, if you will, your task is that you're delivering on and also how um, leadership ties it all together, right? And make sure that no matter what the work that's being done is, it's all grounded in a purpose that is connected to the collective whole, right? And understanding that it's about developing their skill set in whatever capacity. 
Hopefully mm-hmm. that was helpful. That was a little. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I wonder how effective are these tools to change mindsets of people who have been, this is a little bit medical, but have been diagnosed with borderline. Um, okay. So I think that's getting very specific around um, like mental health. Mm-hmm. Here's what I can say. Um, in my personal coaching, uh, I am not a therapist and I'm not a psychiatrist. However, what I do know is that medication only takes us so far. For some, if you're at a negative three or ne- on a spectrum of, let's say, negative five, zero plus five, someone needs to take medication to find some balance for whatever reasons. Medication will only take you so far. Um, individuals and feedback that I personally have experienced from my clients is that they still are at a place where although they're taking medication or they're having whatever it is that is going on, not having tools to implement what I call lifestyle implementation strategies um, keeps them there, right? So how effective it is, I personally don't have like specific data or, or I haven't collected data on that over the last 10 years, but I do know that implementing strategies to put into practice to help with the medication or help with whatever it is, 110% is life-changing because <laughs> the mind is is yeah. totally, you know, mind over matter. The, the mind is a malleable thing, no matter what mindset you hold. Yeah. Uh, Anne says, such good stuff here. Lots of tools to help perfectionists shift that headspace to something softer and ultimately more productive. The word curiosity is so powerful. Thank you. Yes, yeah. very much so, very much so. Uh, okay, that looks like a, all the questions. Um, so uh, Janet just put uh, Heather's email in the, in the chat there. So if I just, if you want to reach out to Heather, she's an awesome, awesome resource. Uh, Jacqueline says, thanks, very interesting stuff. Uh, Alan says, excellent, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this has been so great. So before we go, because we're right at the top of the hour and running out of time, and I know everybody's uh, time is short, but if you were to just distill it all down into just a few sentences, what would be what would you tell everyone here today? What would be the first steps to get started? What would you tell them to do first? Is that for me, or is that for yeah? Me? No, okay. that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thing that I would tell them is to choose to become more self aware choose to talk, listen, recognize, and have grace in the fact that you have inner dialogue. You have another voice and that it is healthy and you're not going crazy. You're just <laughs> so you become more self-aware. <laughs> All right. Heather, thank you so much. This has been spectacular. I really learned a lot today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. For joining. Great um, for yep. So everybody, uh, thanks for joining today. Uh, Just a reminder, you'll get uh, the replay later on today. You'll also get a little survey. So if you wouldn't mind, give us some little feedback. It's nothing hard. Take you a couple of seconds and it helps us out a lot. So I'd appreciate if you guys would take that survey for us. And so thank you again. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday. And I hope the rest of your day is a great one. And we'll see you next Wednesday. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining today's webinar. At the Kentucky SBDC, we know small businesses are the heart of our economy. That's why our goal is to help business owners start, grow, and succeed in Kentucky. Find out more about how our no-cost business coaching, training, and resources can help your business. Visit us at KentuckySBDC.com.